So the first question that I always like to ask my audiences is, uh, how many people in this room at some point in your life have heard this sentence, Barack Obama is a Muslim? <laughs> right, we've all heard that. It's funny because I feel like whenever people say that Barack Obama is a Muslim, I feel like Jerry Seinfeld should pop out and say not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, because as you can probably imagine, uh, being a Muslim in the United States uh, since September 11th uh, has been quite an, uh, quite an interesting life. I mean, uh, for those of us who were born and raised in the United States, our Americanness has been called into question. I remember once uh, I did a uh, live nationally televised debate on a network that will remain nameless, Fox News. <laughs> and uh, as soon as we cut to commercial, the, uh, the anchor looks at me and she goes, that was a really good interview. Your accent didn't come through at all. Where are you from? And I said, Chicago. <laughs> and she goes, no, no, where are you really from? And I said, Chicago. And she asked me that one more time and I, and I walked out of the studio and I said, Chicago. To her, the notion of being a Muslim in America was one of being the other. Yeah. Um, uh, that, we were, uh, that, we were, that we are new immigrants to this country, that we have not contributed anything to this society. And for a lot of people, and I've said this uh, on NPR, I've said this on CNN, and I'll say until the day that I die, for, in, in my opinion, a lot of times when people say that Barack Obama is a Muslim, that's their way of saying that Barack Obama is black. That is their way of otherizing him in a way that is, in my opinion, currently acceptable in today's American socio-political zeitgeist. And I think that as, a, as an international human rights lawyer, uh, and as somebody who tries to stand up for the rights of all human beings around the world, um, you know, f racist xenophobic phenomena like Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and any sort of demonization of any minority group is something that is, uh, that is central to my way of being. And so, I'm thrilled to be sitting here with Leon today, and uh, we're going to have more of an organic conversation about uh, the, where Islamophobia and anti-Semitism stand today vis-a-vis -vis the United States. We're going to talk about Europe as well, uh, the West, and how we can be allies for one another. Um, you know, for me, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are both uh, poisonous fruits of the same Abrahamic tree. And I think that uh, you know, th that's something that is lost in a lot of these narratives when, when we see attacks against Jewish and Muslim communities in the Western world. For example, in 2014, uh, you know, at a Jewish community center in Kansas City, Missouri, there was a white supremacist who walked into the JCC there and, and killed two people. Um, in, you know, he had a race war ideology, uh, but he was never labeled a terrorist. Um, similarly, in 2012, in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, there was another white supremacist named Wade Michael Page who walked into an Indian Sikh temple and shot and killed six people in cold blood on a Sunday morning because he mistook them for Muslims. Um, you know, in, at UNC Chapel Hill a few months ago, there were three Muslim students who were assassinated in cold blood um, by somebody who had espoused anti-religion and anti-Islamic views on his social media Facebook pages. Uh, and uh, the police chalked it up to being a quote-unquote parking dispute. Um, you know, and so uh, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today uh, to talk about this and, and take a lot of your questions and, and have an organic conversation and see the similarities between anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and, and how we as Abrahamic traditions can become allies to one another and uh, in order to fight back against these uh, poisonous fruits. I think the first point we should make, um, or that I will make, is that it's worth remembering just what prejudice really is. Um, if you want to understand anti-Semitism, don't study the Jews, study the non-Jews. And if you want to understand racism, don't study blacks, study whites. And if you want to understand Islamophobia, don't study the Muslims, study the people who are attacking the Muslims. Meaning that there is this to, and you know, in courses in anti-Semitism are always taught in Jewish history in American universities. I've always thought to myself, I mean, we need to be interested in it because we were the victims, but it wasn't us. It wasn't us. Um, to, that, 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 to, to in any way, to study the object of a prejudice in order to understand the prejudice is actually to express the prejudice again. Mm. Because the assumption then is, well, there must be something about the Jews or the Muslims or the blacks that would explain why this happened. And in fact, if you want to understand hatred, you have to understand the people who do the hating, not the people who are the hated. And generally, when it comes to analyzing these phenomena, too often, as I say, people say, well, let's talk about the Muslims. I think, no, 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 let's talk about the people who shot at them. 
um, because that, that's what it's, so um, that's, that's the first thing I think that's, that, that, that's enormously important. And it's not just about blaming the victim, you know, though it's partly that, it's about um, people taking responsibility for their own prejudices and understand, sure. learning to identify what a prejudice is, mm -hmm. you know, what a prejudice is. Um, you know, in the United States right now, anti-Semitism, even though that, that dreadful event happened in Kansas City at the JCC, um, anti-Semitism is not anything that should trouble American Jews sleep right now in this country. Europe, obviously, is a very different story, uh, especially certain countries in Europe. Um, we, the American Jewish community for, has been here, has, well, built institutions of self-defense and has established itself here and has gained a, a certain, deg a great a degree of security that's actually unimaginable by the standards of Jewish history. Mm. Um, and I sometimes think about the new Muslim communities of the United States as being at an earlier stage in that process at an earlier stage in that process. So, you know, I assume that we can talk about more le less lethal um, dimensions of the immigrant experience. You know, I assume that in the Muslim communities of Queens, there are Muslim parents who were really upset that their kids no longer speak Urdu or Arabic, or who were seen on the corner with some Italian boy that they shouldn't have been with. Sure. I mean, I remember this. I mean, this is what we. This is, this is the American story. Yeah. And there is something comforting about the idea to me that America will do for the Muslims what it did for the Jews and what it did for the Catholics. Mm -hmm. The problem is first that it takes time. Mm -hmm. Secondly, that we're living in an era that is deeply inflamed about Islam and Muslims, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think, you know, when you look at the, the Western diasporas of Jewish and Muslim communities, I think it's really important, first of all, not to view them as a monolith, right? And so Absolutely. I think, and, well, mm -hmm. I, and I think that that's, that's a distinction that I always try to make, that the American Muslim community uh, is far better off than our Western uh, European diaspora counterparts. Uh, we are the most highly educated. We are the most uh, socioeconomically empowered. There have been studies that have shown that 58% uh, of American Muslims uh, have a graduate degree of some sort, not just a college degree, but a graduate degree. 42% make over $75,000 a year. Uh, and so, and the reason primarily has been that, uh, historically speaking, America has always had stricter immigration laws than our Western European counterparts. So because America always had stricter immigration laws, the brain drain that came from the Muslim world were all the intelligentsia. They were the doctors, the engineers, the, uh, the highly educated uh, classes. When you look at the, the European, uh, immigration uh, patterns, they had the quote-unquote guest worker programs, which essentially brought slave labor from many parts of the Maghreb, the North Africa, uh, Turkey, other places, the, the blue-collar, less educated people, and essentially these Western European governments thought that they, they would eventually go back home. And now we have fourth and fifth generation you know, uh, Turkish Germans who don't speak a word of Turkish, mm -hmm. but don't feel fully German. Uh, you, know, you have the same phenomenon in France and in Holland and in uh, the UK. And so uh, I think that when, when we talk about the, the Western experience, that uh, you know, the, the American experience is, is far, we're far more advantaged here well, than our European Well, there are two Wests. Continent. There isn't such thing as a West. There's the European West and there's the American right. West. True. In the European West, they're developed in the late 18th, early 19th century, this idea of the nation state. And the basic model was that every nation should be incarnated in a state and every state should embody a nation and the political boundaries and the cultural boundaries would coincide. And of course they never do. And so you had this problem that was known as the problem of minorities. But in Europe, there was never any natural notion or understanding of multi-ethnicity, hmm. never. Yeah, right. um, instead, Europe has been characterized for almost all its history by a terrible problem with the other. And this is, this, you know, this is the demon in, Europe's, in European culture. Yes. Um, in, in the American West, even though it wasn't always the case, and I'm, we're, gonna, we're gonna tell this story very briefly, now and for, in recent decades, multi-ethnicity is a natural social reality. It is normative. Uh, no, you know, we all have the hyphen 
it makes no sense. The Jews in Europe used to be attacked as a state within a state. It would make no sense to call anyone in America a state within a state because America, in this sense, is the United States. Everybody, ex except for the obvious counterexamples, are, is, are from someone, is from somewhere else. Right. Um, and therefore, there is some deep way also in which the hatreds and the prejudices that exist in this country are not legitimate in its public philosophy in the way that hatred and prejudice were, were legitimate in Europe's public. So for example, when Martin Luther came, King came to argue, came to make his great case for equality, he made it in the terms of the American Constitution itself. And he used, the, he held the Constitution up against American practices, and it basically accused America, of, accused segregated America of betraying its own Constitution. Now, that, he didn't have to go outside American philosophy for the categories of his critique. Um, in Europe, certainly in the late 19th century, or the 20th century, you know about, it was perfectly legitimate for a political candidate to run on a platform of anti-Semitism. You didn't have to pretend you were concerned about jobs, right? Or, or a, you could simply say that you were against the Jews. Um, and so, and that was consistent with, in my view, with Europe's um, abysmal and I think incorrigible record about otherness. I mean, I'm one of those people, I'm never disappointed in Europe <laughs> because I expect nothing of Europe in this regard, nothing. Um, which is why I have to say, um, I, you know, I, it's very rare that I say that I, I begin a sentence with the words, I agree with Netanyahu, but I will begin the sentence that I agreed with Netanyahu when he came to France and told the Jews of France to come home. I have to say that whereas he recognized that the Jews of France are facing a classical anti-Semitic threat, and I'll get to the difference in a moment, and they were therefore facing a classical Zionist moment as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, Zionism basically was not a rejection of liberal democracy, it was a despair of Europe. And it said the Jews will never get a fair deal here, and so they should go, et cetera, et cetera. And when Netanyahu said came home, come to them, come home, and everyone went crazy about, you know, what's he, it, that was just Zionism. That was just Zionism. That was a way of saying, they don't want you here. You have a state. We want you with us. It seemed perfectly uncontroversial to me. It seemed perfectly uncontroversial to me. Now, of course, the difference is, now the president of France and the prime minister of France, who is exceptional on this question, exceptional on this. I mean, Valls is one of the heroes of our time in, when it comes to tolerance and the, the struggle against all sorts of xenophobia. They immediately respond. They immediately respond. You know, 20 so, or no more, 30 or 40 years ago, there was a, a radical P P Palestinian group blew up a deli in the Marais called Goldenbergs, and the French president, the prime minister, his comment was something to the effect that, that um, two Jews and four innocent Frenchmen were killed, right? I mean, that wouldn't happen anymore. No. That wouldn't happen anymore. Right. And that's very important. And those Jews who choose to stay in France, I understand their decision because the struggle for liberal democracy is a fundamental struggle as well. Yeah. And if they choose not to despair of that struggle in France, I there's real integrity to that. But uh, all these problems that they face are something that Jews in the United States, it's all, some of them are almost unimaginable here, yeah. precisely because that, that there's no such thing as a single West. Yeah, you know, you bring up two uh, really cogent points that, that I'd like to touch upon. Uh, you know, first of all, you talked about how in Europe's historical past there were politicians whose sole platform was one of anti-Semitism. And now what we're seeing in Europe it, are politicians whose sole platform Absolutely. is Islamophobia. Absolutely. You have Gert Wilders in Holland. You have people like Marine Le Pen right. in France. You have, uh, you know, the uh, BNP in, in Great Britain. I mean, in Switzerland, for God's sake, uh, I think three years ago there were, there were political posters uh, where they had white sheep and they had black sheep on this right. poster, and right. it, it basically said, let's kick the, let's kick right. the Muslims out. Um, and so you're absolutely right in that. Well, they didn't want mosques built. Right? Oh, well, yeah. The, the minarets. They, they, they the banned minarets, minarets in, in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you have you know, the 2004 uh, you know, French uh, ban on the hijab, the headscarf by Jacques Chirac. Um, you know, so, so we are absolutely seeing that. When you talk, and the second point that I wanted to bring up is when you talk about a state within a state, uh, I, I find that particularly relevant uh, for the American Muslim community today because, um, you know, there, 
Again, uh, how many people in this room have at some point heard that Islamic Sharia law is coming to take over America? We've all, we've all heard that at some point, right? And it's really funny when people say that, and, and we have politicians who are saying this, and apparently they have not read the supremacy clause of the Constitution, which st states that the Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land. So not only should these politicians not be allowed to run for office, they should retroactively fail ninth grade civics class. Um, and, and you know, when people talk about Islamic Sharia law creeping on our American soil, I always like to ask people, uh, well, wh what gave us away? Is it, our, is it our two members of Congress? Is it our zero senators, our zero governors, our zero Supreme Court justices? Um, you know, but I, I think that this, you know. Well, the absence of any evidence only proves how deep the conspiracy right. is. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it's really interesting, especially within the European paradigm, because a lot of times, uh, you know, European Muslim communities look to, to the American West mm -hmm. to try and remedy some of their ills, and, right. and, and vice versa, even though oftentimes it's the American, it's our constitutional democracy that helps to, um, you know, protect us. And then also, you know, here- well, On in, the question about willing hate speech, for example. Correct. Right, right. And, and also, you know, and, and historically also, in America, we have the separation of church and state. Well, in Europe, they have the separation of church from state, mm -hmm. right? They, they have a, this visceral historical response that we don't have. And so, um, you know, in, in, I, I tell people that Muslims can practice Islam in the United States of America better than in any country in the world, including the 57 Muslim-majority mm -hmm. nations on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Hands down, there's, I can give you empirical evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's interesting, uh, the Pew Center uh, every year comes out with a, a study on Americans' attitudes towards uh, religious demographic groups. And uh, historically, for the last 10, 15 years, it was always atheists that came in second to last, uh, Muslims who came in second to last, and atheists who were always ranked the lowest. And, and this year was actually the first year that Muslims are at, at the bottom of that totem pole, and, and atheists have surpassed us uh, by one percentage point. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it's really interesting because, obviously, as a human rights lawyer, uh, you know, I, I look at our struggle here in the United States as the next chapter in the civil rights history of America. I mean, you know, it's no, it, it's no different than the, you know, the Catholics who were mm -hmm. persecuted you know, by the Germanic Protestants in the gangs of New York phenomena, uh, what Jewish Americans have gone through. Um, and so, and tomorrow it'll be somebody else. You know, that's mm -hmm. the thing. You know, when, once we've sort of been normalized, it'll be another, it, it'll be another uh, demographic group. And I'm always amused when, or not amused is too kind a word, I'm always put out when I hear Jews worrying about Sharia coming to America because Orthodox Jews repair to resort to rabbinical courts all the time. Mm -hmm. There is a vast network of rabbinical courts in this country. Um, they are sophisticated judicial institutions. Yeah. They base themselves entirely on halacha, on the body of Jewish law, with no reference whatsoever. They pose no threat to American Jewish citizenship in this country. Um, and so the, you know, the hypocrisy of those people is, is it always puts me out. Um, the one complication I think we should add, and I'm sure you agree to the European story, is that you have in the, some of the Muslim communities, the immigrant Muslim, newer Muslim communities in Europe, there are powerful separatist and secessionist strains so that you have the double tragedy, I think, of certain Muslim communities, and I don't mean whole Muslim communities, but certain strains, currents within the Muslim communities in various European countries who don't wish to integrate into a society that actually doesn't want them to integrate into itself. So you've got this kind of double tragedy yeah. going on. You know, they arrived to a Europe, this is certainly true uh, in England, to a society that basically had accepted multiculturalism as a social value, which allows them to flourish in some ways, um, which doesn't question their apartness as illegitimate and doesn't press them to assimilate in the way that it would have in earlier generations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I sometimes wonder about American Jews. American Jews pride themselves rightly upon their, the achievements of the immigrants who came between 1880 and 1920. But I sometimes think, you know, they, they learned English, they, 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 they became powerful economic actors, they built all these institutions. But sometimes I wonder, what would the American Jewish community have been like if those immigrants in the great wave of immigration had arrived at a multicultural society and a welfare state? 
What if they'd come to an America in which people didn't have to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, close quote, but in which there were, what if they'd come to an America that didn't press them, that, in which, there were, in which, there were, which was not a melting pot, right? Now, it turns out in the event that the melting pot melted too much and that, um, and we then, it, it corrected and we became an American ethnicity like other American ethnicities. Um, and we got, as Moynihan and Glazer said, beyond the melting pot. Um, not only does American society not require us or anybody to erase their particularisms, it actually rewards them for the expression of their particularisms. It celebrates difference. Um, but I sometimes, you know, but again, historical circumstances matter. And um, as I say, the, the tragedy for me in Europe, when I mean, and again, you know the situation of the Muslim communities much better than I do, is that you've got the hostility of European culture in various places, and you've got the, the, um, the secessionism, the separatism of certain Muslim communities, and, you, and it's a perfect storm. It is. It's a perfect storm. It is, and, uh, and I think the, the important thing to highlight is that you mentioned that these, these communities came into countries and societies that didn't want them, right? And so, you know, in, in France, for example, today, if you're applying for a job and you have a North African, Arab, Muslim-sounding name, they will literally throw your resume into the garbage can. They don't even pretend like they're not mm -hmm. discriminating against you. Um, and I, I've been to the banlieue, I've been to the suburbs after the unrest in 2005, and, and I saw these enclaves, right? These are, these are kids who are undereducated. The unemployment rate is between 25 and 30 percent in some parts of these suburbs. Um, these are purely French-speaking Muslims. Mm -hmm. you know, these are kids who have never been to Tunisia or yeah. Algeria yeah. Or, or Morocco or Libya. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they were born and raised in France, and they have grown up seeing a society that, only, that not only doesn't want them, but in some ways actively you know, has hostile overt acts against them, like the, the headscarf ban or the minaret ban, uh, you know, these sorts of things. And well, the headscarf ban is a perfect example of the difference between the European West and the American yeah. West. It's the perfect oh, example. Yeah. Um, in France, universalism, which is a, a, a worldview that I mostly subscribe to with great enthusiasm, is coercive. That is to say, it's not, it's not voluntaristic. Mm -hmm. and they, it, it, it's not only hypocritical because the French government subsidizes Catholic schools. Yeah, they do. So it's not only hypocritical, yeah. um, which is a very typical European kind of hypocrisy, but, um, but it is, um, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. It's wrong. I mean, you cannot, th they will not allow people, th well, let's put it this way. They are so threatened about their own religious identity and their own French identity mm -hmm. that they fear that the expression of a Muslim identity in the public square will somehow endanger it further, which I always find outrageous because if you, you know, I always say this, I say this to Jews too, if you're having trouble transmitting your faith and your traditions to your children, and if you're unhappy that your children are not quite the Jews um, or the Muslims or the Catholics that you hope they would be, don't blame other people. Right. Don't blame other people. The fact that there are non-Jews around you has nothing to do with the fact that you failed to transmit Judaism adequately to your children. Um, the blame is entirely internal. Absolutely. The blame is entirely internal, um, and et cetera, et cetera. And I think a lot of times, you know, in, in, you know the, the thing, again, that troubles me, obviously, is, is, is seeing anti-Semitism within the Muslim community and Islamophobia within no. the Jewish community. Yeah, uh, that, that's that's especially troubling to me. Doubly painful. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Um, in, in in many ways, to me, it, it sort of marks the, the the victory of the, the majority societies that have, in in ways, helped to pit that have turned us against yeah. each other. Yeah, and, and and I think that that can't be underscored enough either. Um, and and so I, I think and but I think that in the American West here, again, we've come a, you know a, a a much greater distance in terms of of bridging that divide, um, you know than than our European counterparts. So for example, after the, the JCC shooting in Kansas City, uh, you know, I took to Facebook and Twitter and to my 100,000 followers, I said this, should be an, this is an act of domestic terrorism. Mm -hmm. and, and for many people to see a Muslim human rights lawyer you know, stand up and, and you know, call out terrorism against the Jewish community center, that was 
that was jarring for some people, and, and I don't want, like, I, I want it to become the norm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I think that when, when Muslims are able to speak out against anti-Semitism, when, when Jewish communities are, are able to speak out against Islamophobia, um, I think that just add, I, I think that, that adds more credibility to, to addressing the, the core problems of these issues, not these, not these singular attacks, these singular events where, you know, it's, it's one gunman here and there. Um, and, and I think that that's the, the point of all this is that, you know, since Judaism and Islam are, are part of the Abrahamic trifecta, uh, you know, I think that gets lost a lot. You know, I, I, well, you know, the ba in the Jewish tradition, the basis for social compassion and social solidarity is the memory of one's own experience of persecution, mm -hmm. right? Because you were once a slave in Egypt. Yep. Now, uh, it's been a long time since American Jews have ever remembered that they were a slave in Egypt. Um, and I think that, um, you know, <coughs> the solidarity always requires imagination. You have to be able to imagine the predicament of people whose lives are other than your own. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes for certain people that's hard. And you have to remind them. You have to remind them. Um, yeah, you have to remind them. There was a time when Jews had memories of anti-Semitism. Uh, now they have reports of memories of anti-Semitism, I mean in this country. Uh, and that's good. I mean, I'm not one of those, there are these fools running around who say that a little anti-Semitism would be very good for Jewish identity. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Also, the kind, of, the kind of identity that depends upon external hostility yeah. is a weak and worthless kind it's of identity absurd. anyway. Yeah. Absurd, absurd. But um, sometimes it requires leaps of imagination. What, I, I want to ask you: What do you think, in terms of, what do you think? Are, what do you think the roles are of European governments and, and our American government? I mean, to a lesser extent, focusing more on European governments, to uh, what can they do to help combat anti-Semitism or Islamophobia within their? Well, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm in the minority. When, when I talk to my Euro European friends, I mean, I actually don't like laws against hate speech. I think that it should not be against the law in Germany to say that the Holocaust was a hoax. Um, I believe in free speech. Uh, I really do believe in free speech. And I think that open societies were designed for the giving and taking of offense. And I think that um, instead of getting into a situation in which not only are certain things forbidden by law to be said, but in which social mores forbid certain things to be said, and people are investigating everybody's right to, to say what they're saying or not saying. I want everyone to say what it is that they think. I want to know what everybody thinks, even the ugly stuff, and I want everybody to thicken their skins. Mm -hmm. um, now, in Europe, they don't take this view. In Europe, they don't take this view. Um, and I think that's, in the long term, a mistake. I think, um, I have to say that, um, the, most that, the most that governments, I mean, you can outlaw discriminatory practices, obviously. Sure. You, can, you can use the legal system. But really what you want, the most you can do is to destroy the legitimacy and raise the social cost of prejudice in a society. In other words, governments cannot eradicate what is in a human heart. Right. It cannot be done. But what you can do is create a society in which the expression of those ugly values brings down upon you real social opprobrium, in which, you, in which one is ashamed to say certain things. And for me, that's, that's almost revolutionary progress. Mm -hmm. That's almost revolutionary progress. Um, I think that most of the answer lies within the communities themselves. I think that the respective communities have got to have to have the internecine intellectual battles against the demons in their own midst. Mm -hmm. I think all the communities have to do that. So do you think that Europe is headed in the right direction or the wrong direction vis-a-vis -vis these phenomena? I can't tell. I think that you take France. I think um, in France, the state is where I'd like it to be. The society is not. Uh, and one must make distinctions between state and society. Um, you know, I, I, again, I think you, you, go, you go from country to country, culture to culture. Um, I think that, that anti-Semitism, the, the resurgence of anti-Semitism is a historically interesting phenomenon because what had happened to European anti-Semitism after the Second World War is that um, it, was basically, it was basically adopted by 
um, anti-Jewish or certain anti-Zionist elements in the Middle East. Hmm. And I think that um, you know, the career of anti-Semitism in the 20th and 21st century is a very complicated one. Um, and I think that too much, too much that goes for anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic. Uh, there's a lot of prejudice that hides, you know, from, you can hide prejudice behind almost anything. Sure. Behind almost, you can prettify it and ornament it and, you know, you're not against immigrants, you're for jobs, for <laughs> Americans, right? That kind of thing. Right. Um, but no, I think what I, the, the more I, the older I get, basically, and I see how hard this work is, the more I come to the conclusion that it's the responsibility of the communities themselves to delegitimate and to root out the ugly elements within them. But what about, so for example, um, but what, what about political players? I mean, uh, you know, Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal. Uh, yeah, he's uh, special. Yeah, he yeah. is, in many ways. Yeah. Uh, a few months ago, while he was touring London, he started yeah. talking about the so-called Muslim no-go zones, which is this conspiracy theory which has been debunked by British Prime Minister yes, David Cameron, absolutely. Angela Merkel of Germany, basically saying that these are, uh, you know, these are places where non-Muslims are not allowed to go. And which, of course, was a total fiction. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's total a, fiction. It's been conspiracy theory completely right. debunked. But again, perpetuated by uh, Jindal in this case. Well, it's nice to have, especially. You know, it's really special to have that come from someone named Priyush Jindal. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and, and what, we have, what I have seen, at least, you know, as, as an American Muslim, uh, you know, journalist and commentator, is this, uh, the, there, there's a faction of the Republican Party here in the United States um, that is actually... That's correct. It, that, that's essentially learning from their European counterparts that they can score some political points uh, against, uh, you know, against a minority that hasn't, that, again, like... Well, the, again, they, first of all, they're scoring the political points against the minority whose votes they're desperate to have. Yeah. That's the, that's, I mean, it's politically lunatic. You put aside the moral dimension of it. Um, sometimes it's, you know, I have to say one of the most delightful things recently has been the, um, the how should we put it, the, the undoing of Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, that, those are two words that I, I always regret ever using in a sentence. But, I mean, um, but, you know, when he referred to immigrants as rapists, um, he experienced the full fury um, of his employers, of society. It's been a very positive thing to watch. It's been, I mean, his undoing is a, just a joy to behold. Um, <laughs> now, you're right, but you're right. The Republicans have not yet made up their minds about whether to banish these demons from their midst or to try to batten off them politically. And every, you know, after every presidential election that they lose, you get six months of op-ed pieces by Republicans saying, we, next time we're finally gonna get it right. We're not gonna do culture wars. We're not gonna be against immigrants. We're not gonna play nasty stereotypes. And then along, you know, three and a half years goes, three and a half years go by, and here we are again. Um, you're right, you're right. Um, it, it's, really, it's, it's really awful to watch. It's really awful to watch. And, and it's really interesting for, for, for those of us you know, who are, are American Muslims, who are native born to this country, yeah. who have known no other country to feel as though we are strangers in a strange land. Yeah. Uh, again, ask, being asked by Fox News anchors where we're from, um, you know, things like that. And, well, and you remember there was that very touching moment but it was bittersweet for the following reason. You remember during the, the 2008 debates, um, some woman yeah, got gonna, the mic, to the mic that. and said that Obama is a Muslim and John McCain, who I have to say I know very well and I, he is a very good, He's decent a good man. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 really he is. Um, but he took the mic from her and he said, no ma'am. And he said he's, he's a, a Christian, he's a, and I thought to myself, No, he said he, he's a he, he's a good. What did he, he's a he's a good man. He's a good man. So I thought to myself, No, no, he's a good man. And I thought to myself, Well, good for you, John, yeah. because that's the right thing to do. On the other hand, you were conceding that the term Muslim was a pejorative, right. and that made me say. Now, of course, he didn't mean. Yeah, to of course do not. That. It was a town hall. No, but but also it would. But but what he was reflecting was contemporary American usage. Mm -hmm. In other words, it was. And when he did it, everyone saw the admirable side, which was truly admirable, and it took a while for some people to say, wait a second. I mean, you know, the, if, the opposite of Muslim is not good man. Right. 
um, et cetera. So that's, it was one of those moments in, 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 in the, one of those public moments where you could see how deep certain prejudices go. Yeah, and, and you know, during the same 2008 presidential campaign when the whisper campaigns were going around you know, about Barack being a crypto Muslim Manchurian candidate, uh, you know, we didn't hear anybody speak out against it. You know, nobody in the Democratic Party would touch it with a 10-foot pole. It wasn't until a Republican former Secretary of State, Colin Powell, That's right went on Meet the Press with Tim Russert only three months before the general election, and he finally called out his own Republican Party. Yeah. Um, you know, but it was, you know, this was six, nine months of, of you know, this buildup. And, and to keep in mind, to show you how, how toxic it got, uh, at, a, at an Obama campaign event in Dearborn, Michigan, two Muslim women who wore the headscarf, the hijab, were actually pulled out of a photo opportunity with then-candidate Obama by Obama's own campaign mm -hmm. volunteers themselves. So just imagine that even the, the, yeah. the, uh, the asso in a group photo, yeah. even the insinuation, the association of anything Muslim with Barack, the optics were so bad that even his own liberal volunteer staff pulled them out. And, and, and that's the thing. And again, I, I, I do want to, I, I, you know, to be intellectually honest, this is not something that's exclusive to the Republican Party. No. You know, you, no. we remember during the, the 2008 uh, Democratic primary, you might remember there was a, a photo leaked once of, of candidate Obama wearing a white Kenyan garb. You guys remember that? With the, the, the headdress and stuff? That was actually leaked by Hillary Clinton's campaign. Hmm. Most people don't know that fact. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, and, and it, was, it, it was to score a few points. Um, you know, because again, that was, you know, uh, that was a way of, of, of otherizing him. And um, to this day, eight years later, Barack Obama has still not set foot inside an American mosque yet. That doesn't he's, he's, he's visited m many foreign mosques when, during his trips to Egypt, Turkey, everywhere. He will not set foot inside an American mosque because right-wingers will be like, see, we told you so. Because he's not a brave man, that's why. He, his identity it was extraordinary, not, not, it, not just for the color of his skin, but for its truly compound nature. Mm -hmm. um, he really is the personification of the new America in that way. Yeah. Now that says nothing about whether I support him or do not. The fact was, however, that his election, the election of such an individual was a real landmark moment. Absolutely. There's no question about it. Um, but as I say, I mean, I've, I always hoped during his, the past six years that he would actually demonstrate more leadership on race in this country. Um, now there's not another election and we've had this horrible year, yeah. um, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, Anyway, I wish he would have gone into a mosque too. Yeah. Should we open it up for Q&A? Why not? All right, yes. You want to take the lead? Uh, hmm? Questions? Sir. Oh, could you oh, stand up? There, and the, and uh, there, could you use the microphone? microphone? Those are the only two demands we're going to make right now. Some, yeah, some people. Yeah, you know, if I, if I had a dime for every time somebody said that mm -hmm. Muslims haven't condemned terrorism enough, I wouldn't have to be sitting up here. Um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that we, we have. I mean, if you, type, if you type in the words Muslim condemned terrorism on Google, you'll receive over a million hits from every <laughs> Muslim community, every Islamic institution around the world. And I always tell people that I could literally stand on a street corner with a bullhorn for the remaining days, weeks, months, years, decades of my life condemning terrorism, which I've been doing nonstop for the last 15 years. Uh, and, and for some people, it still wouldn't be enough. I mean, uh, th the fact is that um, we, we have been, and th but the problem is that that's not what gets airtime. You know, there's an, ad there's an adage in journalism, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Mm -hmm. So the more sensationalistic, you know, if, if you can find some kook with a beard somewhere, you know, espousing anti-American stuff, he's going to get the airtime, not the, you know, dozens and dozens of Muslim scholars and, and leaders who are, you know, issuing public statements and having press conferences uh, condemning terrorism. And so to answer your question, I mean, I, I think that the, great, the, the responsibility becomes on the media to, to cover the, the condemnations because they have been there. I mean, my, hair, my hairs have, are starting to turn white from, you know, over a decade and a half of, of doing it. But, but for some people, it'll, it'll never be enough. But and the assumption, not of your question, but the, this, this notion that Muslims loudly and immediately need to condemn terror, terrorism, sometimes what disturbs me is that the premise of that is that they need to convince us that they don't really approve of terrorism. 
And I'm thinking, who in their right minds? I mean, there are, we're talking about millions of people, good people with families and, 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 and you know, traditional families, uh, so social institutions, communal institutions. The idea that these millions of people, we need to know that they don't approve of terrorism. I mean, I would get offended if I heard that someone demanded to know why Jews didn't, um, you know, let, let's say, and I'm with, mutating the mutanda here completely, didn't sufficiently condemn uh, the use of force in Gaza last summer, which is a very controversial thing. And I thought the Israeli army actually went too far, and I wrote that, and I said that, and fine. But I didn't say that because I needed to prove to anybody that Jews actually approve of the killing of children. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the premise is offensive to me. Not of your question, I mean. Wait, wait, but hold on. I don't even want my friend to have to answer this. Hold on, hold on. Um, while it is true, and I think undeniable, and we talked about this earlier, that if someone kills someone as he screams Allahu Akbar, that there is an Islamic dimension to that crime, it is also true that Islam, like Judaism, is a religion of interpretation, and there are many, many, many strains of Islam and types of Muslims, and it is not the case that an act of violence is representative of an entire religion. When a Jew who went to the yeshiva that I went to when I was a boy savagely murdered Palestinians, um, shot them dead in Hebron in 1980, uh, 1994, I think, um, uh, it, it, you know, I, I was very clear that those of us who come from that background have to take responsibility and search our hearts and see if there was something went, went wrong, right? But the idea that Baruch Goldstein's act was ex exemplified Judaism um, is preposterous. It's preposterous. Um, and I think we have to be more sophisticated um, in our understanding of what these religions are, of what these religions are. They're complicated entities, they're civilizations. And every civilization contains every sort, everything within it, including violence, I have to say, including violence. There is no great religion, no great monotheistic religion that is not responsible and has not been responsible for the perpetration of violence and for the killing of innocent individuals. There is no such religion. And they all have provided religious justifications at, at various times and of various kinds. And we have to be very clear about this. We have to be very clear about this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and there is a double standard to play, uh, you know, where, where Muslims are placed with collective guilt in a way that other demographic groups are not. So a few years ago uh, in Norway, Anders Breivik killed 77 right. kids on an island and tried right. to assassinate the prime minister of Norway, left behind a 1,500-page treatise calling himself a soldier of Christianity. Now, mm -hmm. we didn't expect pastors, priests, the Vatican to right. go on right. national television and, and condemn it because we knew that he was a raving murderer. But sadly, there is a double standard at place where there is a collective guilt placed on Muslims today. Whenever anybody uh, commits an act of terror and they happen to be a Muslim, that there is some sort of collective responsibility on the behalf of, of the Muslim community. It is important for us to get out there and, and, and say that we're against these sorts of things. But again, you know, we, we, don't, we don't place the same sort of burden on any other religious group in the world today. I mean, the real response, I mean, I would say that, you know, this is not a clash of civilizations because, not least because every civilization contains the clash within itself. Sure. Um, there are no uniform monoliths. Yeah, there's no monoliths. Uh, so, you know, if there are Muslims, if there are Muslims who commit terrorism, sure. it is the solemn responsibility of the respective Muslim communities to, f to, to bear down and to fight those elements within its midst that are responsible for such violence. About that, that, about that I have no doubt. Moreover, I have no doubt that nothing that Jews or Christians or, or Western governments will do or say will have as much of an impact to stem Muslim terrorist violence than the, 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 the spiritual and intellectual pushback of Muslims themselves. And that is true of all the communities. That is true of all the communities. We're all res we're responsible for our own communities. Um, 
and, and et cetera. Well, and I also think that, very quickly before we move on to the next question, is that the term terrorism has been co-opted. The term terrorism has been co-opted to only apply when a brown Muslim man commits an act of mass murder, right? So a New America Foundation recently came out with a study that showed that right-wing uh, white militia groups have, have perpetrated more, have killed more Americans in acts of terrorism since 9-11 than quote-unquote Islamist terrorists. Right, but we, uh, if you ask the average American to name you know, one of these acts, you'll, you'll never find it. Well, again, it's a little encouraging that after the massacre in Charleston, this became a, a subject of debate and controversy. Finally, this, this is it's actually, starting. it's starting. It's starting. Yeah, it's starting. Yeah. Back there. Given the issues you raise, is there a role in the American educational system for comparative religion classes? to help young people come to be more familiar with their neighbors and their neighbors' beliefs. Yes, I mean, the, you know, the basis of fear is almost always ignorance. Uh, almost always, not always. Sometimes you're afraid, you're, you have your eyes open and there's a threat and so on. But, 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 but the, the kind of fear that we're talking, the fear of the other is, is based on ignorance. So yes, the more, the more diverse American education is, the more American school children get exposed to, I mean, you know, to all the traditions that now thrive in this country. I mean, it's extraordinary how many traditions and religions thrive in this country. Yes, I think there is. I think there is. Well, and yeah, and, and you know, as a human rights lawyer, I always tell people that it's always hard to demonize people once they've been humanized to you, right? And, and the example that I always like to give is, is the marriage equality debate. You know, 20 years ago, the gay marriage debate was the most polarizing, you know, debate in our American political right. zeitgeist. But I think that, in my, in my opinion, you know, I, I've, I have conservative, evangelical, Republican Christian friends who are, are, they might be philosophically opposed to the notion of gay marriage, but they probably have a gay cousin somewhere, right? I've had friends say, well, you know, I'm opposed to gay marriage, but my cousin Joe is gay, and I love him, greatest guy in the world, right? right. That, that humanizes them to the issue at hand. And, you know, there have been polls that have, done, that have been done that show that uh, approximately 70% of Americans say that they don't know a Muslim. Mm -hmm. Well, you probably do. Your doctor's probably. A probably a, your doctor's a Muslim, your you know, car mechanic's probably a Muslim. You probably just don't know that they're a Muslim. You know, most people don't know that five out of the last 12 Nobel Peace Prize winners were Muslims, including three, three Muslim women. There have now been five Muslim women, uh, including See, recently. See, I like when you talk about Nobel Prize winners because you're talking like a Jew. Well, and I, and I was telling him that I actually played an Orthodox rabbi once in a college there drama production. There you go, production. exactly. Yes. So uh, I'm a total. But nerd. I want to tell a story. I mean, again, it, I, something happened to me this year that was so quietly moving. I have a young son, and he likes to wear nice suits. So I have to take him some, to Lord and Taylor's where they have nice suits in his size. And he likes to have his two suits altered by the, ta the tailor. He likes them fitted. So we had to, I had to pick up my son's suit one evening. And I went to get it at Lord and Taylor's in Chevy Chase. And when I got to the floor, out of the dressing room walked the most divinely adorable little African-American boy wearing what must have been a suit the size four or five. I mean, the cutest damn thing you ever saw. I think it even had a vest. Nice. And he was smiling into the mirror, and his mother came out, and I looked at him, and I said, you look really handsome. And his mother said, you look like the President of the United States. And I thought, and that's when I got it. I never got it until then. And I'm a good liberal fellow, and I, after Obama was elected, I danced outside the White House and wrote about it. When she said that, I fi it finally sunk into my thick liberal brain what the election of Obama must have meant. Um, but not until then, because these things are really very deep. They're really very deep. Well, and, and also, uh, for me, as, as, as a, a religious pluralist, my thing is that an attack on any house of worship is an attack on all houses of worship. Whether it's a church, synagogue, mosque, temple, anything, we, we have to stand up as Americans. If we, if we truly believe in, in freedom mm -hmm. of religion, if we truly believe in our pluralistic society, and I think that that's where that allyship really, really mm -hmm. can help. I think that's right. Because, yeah. again, people always expect me to talk about Islamophobia. People accept, expect Leon to talk about anti-Semitism, but people wouldn't expect me to talk about anti-Semitism or Leon to talk about Islamophobia. I think that you know, th this allyship that, that we can provide for one another as, 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 uh, as people of, of faith um, is something that uh, cannot be underscored enough. Let's see, here, here. Given, uh, wait, 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 wait. Given the demographic situation, 
President Europe, mm -hmm. and without the changes, how do you see religious pluralism going forward in the Western world? Well, I think religious pluralism is a, almost a brand new idea in Europe. I mean, I think that pluralism is something that Europe is about to learn the hard way um, because they are, they are now multi-ethnic societies, whether they preferred to be one or not, they are. And I think that the experience of multi-ethnicity will inevitably revise their thinking, I hope. I mean, it, it won't revise the thinking of of racists, it will only harden it. It will only because they will panic, um, which is what racists always do. Um, but yeah, I think that as as this story continues, and as the sociological realities, as they become accustomed to their new sociological realities, I have to believe that certain concepts of multi-ethnicity, of pluralism, of you know, I mean, plur by the way, pluralism in America dates really only the idea of it from the 1920s. Pluralism is not in the American Constitution. Rights of the individual is in the American Constitution, but pluralism, meaning rights for groups as the groups that they are, dates only from the 1920s. It was proposed by a Jewish poli American political thinker called Horace Cowan in a magazine that used to exist called The New Republic. And, um, well, well played, and, well played. Yes. Um, but so I think that experience will, I, will teach them pluralism. They are liberal democratic societies, but they are liberal democratic societies of a certain kind. And hopefully they will learn from experience. Well, and and to, to piggyback on what Leon said, I think that um, being the eternal optimist, I have faith in the local grassroots communities. Uh, you know, so for example, after the, the Charlie Hebdo attacks mm -hmm. in Paris, you know, you had uh, Parisian imams and rabbis getting together you know, to, to facilitate dialogue and conversation. Here in the US happens every time there's a hate crime attack mm -hmm. at a synagogue or a mosque. You know, you have local religious clergy from all, all, mon uh, all faith traditions uh, get together. And so I have actually a lot more faith in the local grassroots communities who, again, have been humanized to one another. They, they've broken bread together. Um, as I, I'm more worried about the, the sort of the, the, the ivory towers of, of our you know, of, of our respective societies? And, and how do we shift narratives within those ivory towers to make for uh, more pluralistic society? So I think at the grassroots level, we'll, we'll be fine, but it's, it's the ivory towers that I'm worried about. Two quick questions. Number one, in distinguishing between How much does the concept of the European nation state play into that? And a more difficult question for me as a Zionist is, as Israel is trying to establish itself as a homeland of Jewish people, adopting a nation state model, yeah. how do I, as an American Zionist, relate? You, you're, asking, you're asking a very important and tough and right question. Um, Zionism, European Zionism, which is what, what Zionism was, um, basically was a translation of the European theory of the nation state into Jewish experience. The Zionists took the European model of nationalism, which as I described before, I, I, which believed that ideally the cultural and political boundaries would coincide. But since they never do, all these European national, nation states experienced the problem of minorities. Um, Israel was founded on that sort of nationalism, and it is indeed experiencing the problem of minorities. Um, by the problem of minorities here, I do not mean the Palestinians of the occupied territories. That's a separate question. They do not live in Israel, thank God. And may they never live in Israel. May they live in Palestine. And may the two states live peacefully together until the cows come home. Amen. All right, but the Israeli Arabs are the, are the Israeli Jewish experience of the problem of minorities that bedeviled European nationalism. And, um, and this is a complicated, we don't have time to get into this. The, the Israeli record on this question, I think, I mean, com compared to other states has been stellar, compared to the ideals to which Jews and Zionists hold themselves has sometimes been less than stellar, but I think that is the right framework within which to understand that problem. Yes, sir, I promised you. Uh, I'll tell you, I think that the, the, um, 
I think that J Street is having success. I think J Street represents a, 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 a part of the American Jewish community. I don't think that there was, um, how should I put this? I think that uh, certain proponents of J Street, in my view, have exaggerated the extent to which there was not a debate within the American Jewish community. Um, we've been quarreling about these things for decades. Um, I don't think that APEC is a, this monstrous engine of repression um, that some people think it is. Um, but I, I, and I think there is a healthy debate going on in the American Jewish community. J Street contributes to it. It existed before J Street. Um, APAC is not nearly monolithic. Some views that you would think you'd find only in J Street, you can find at APAC's policy conference too. Um, but there, you know, there is a lively debate going on. Um, I'm not, you know, by now all the taboos are gone. When I was coming up, it was still, you were not allowed to criticize Israel in public. Um, by the way, this was a taboo broken mainly by the right, not by the left. I mean the Jewish right, not the Jewish left after Oslo. But you were not allowed to criticize. If you were for even recognizing the PLO, you were some sort of traitor. Um, the good news is that the handshake on the lawn took place. Everybody speaks their minds. This is a free country. The American Jewish community is a free community. Um, and that, I, I no longer have any anxieties about that. Yeah. Oh. Sir. Okay, so applaud in a minute. Yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I can't hear you with what? Oh. Oh, look, um, we live by many values. I mean, all of us do, not just Jews. So on the one hand, there is the value of homeland, and that's why I'm a Zionist, and I understand why the Jews should have a state and why Jews who want to live there should live there and so on. And even, um, on the other hand, I believe in freedom for all people and that Jews being people like all other people should live wherever they want to live. So if Jews choose to return to Germany, or I don't even know what return to Spain means, it's been 500 years, <laughs> you know, um, they should live wherever they want, and, I, I, you know, and hopefully in peace and unimpeded in the practice of their traditions and beliefs. Um, you know, the, the fate of the Jewish, the fate of the Jews left Europe at the end of the Second World War. Um, in other words, there are still important Jewish communities in Europe, just as there is one in Russia, There's, there are Jews in Iran, there's an important community in Argentina. But uh, after the Second World War, the fate of the, of the Jews will be determined largely by what happens to the community in Israel and by what happens to the community in the United States, both of which are new paradigms when compared to the, bar, to the situation of the Jews in Europe. Um, I think that Jews have to have universal solidarity for each other, and so we have to be concerned when Jews living wherever they live experience anti-Semitism or so on. But basically, um, if Sephardic Jews want to go back to Spain, um, I, you know, I let, I mean, fine, fine. I mean, if you've ever been to Girona, Girona is the most beautiful preserved medieval Jew Jewry in, in, in the world. It's a gorgeous, moving, lyrical place. Um, the problem with it is that if you stand in the Jewish, medieval Jewish quarter of Girona, you will immediately note, and this was always the case, that the church was built right above it, so that every time a Jew walked in the streets, he saw an actual physical architectural metaphor for his own subordination to Christianity. But if people want to go live there, um, fine. Um, okay, now you can applaud. Thank you, my friend.